Welcome to part 3. Then the Lord says what his food consists of, which gives him the strength to continue. As an obedient, dependent man, he gains his strength from doing the will of the Father he presents here as the one who sent him to accomplish his work. To accomplish his work is to declare the name of his Father and to glorify him. He fully recognizes the faithful service of his workers in earlier days. These are the prophets who spoke through the Spirit of Christ about the Savior and about the suffering that would come over Christ and the glory afterwards. What they have sown has not been in vain. The time to reap has been delayed, but has now arrived with the coming of the Son of God. So this plateau of the sun, this mountaintop, this watch mountain is a very important location of a transition of a former time frame into a new time frame of the onset of the reaping of the end times harvest. And that's why I believe the summer solstice time frame and this particular eclipse is so important to us. Now, back to the Samaritan woman. So, after the woman is given understanding of both the availability and her need for living water, her natural understanding is lifted to the eternal and she understands she is offered eternal assurance and rest in him. In exchange to her ministering to him the earthly water accessible to her. Her testimony of him out of the inner well springing up in her as Jesus foretold draws her people unto the Lord but they only believe him after hearing him themselves as he abides with them for two days or prophetically indicative of the 2,000 years um, up to now. The Samaritans commence to put their faith in and entrust their spiritual well-being to Christ. After initially believing in him because of the woman's testimony going ahead of him, in addition to them expecting the Messiah to come, they had foreknowledge. And we see this reflected in the heavens because the planet Mercury, this chief speaker, also related to Paul, but also to a Roman thief, precedes the sun on the ecliptic. And currently, Mercury is already in the bride and broom, groom constellation, where the sun will join Mercury shortly. That was expect, uh, resonating with their expectation of the coming Messiah. So after the Samaritans went out to meet Jesus themselves and invited him to stay with him, with them, which he did for two days, many more believed because of his personal visitation. So we see a revival of faith amongst the new Christians after a summer solstice picture and a divine encounter of both the Lord and new believers in addition to a divine exchange between the Lord and his disciples. So, a fellow believer in Christ, John Ting, shares, The Samaritan woman is neither Jew nor Gentile, since the Samaritans are half-Jews, a mixed race between Jews and Gentiles. Hence, she represents the Christian, according to Paul in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So, in this narrative of the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus crosses racial, cultural, and gender boundaries so prevalent in the division fostered by the enemy today. And Jesus shows how to overcome that in Jesus Christ. The Samaritan woman is the first foreshadowed born-again believer in the Gospel of John. Although Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the born-again experience in the previous chapter, chapter 3, Despite being the religious leader, Nicodemus didn't get it. <laughs> in contrast, the Samaritan woman, she believed in the living water Jesus talked about and became the first evangelist in the Gospel of John by telling other Samaritans and leading them to the faith in Jesus. The living water is the Holy Spirit. So hers was the first salvation of the first evangelist by the bridegroom himself, 
propose to find its second fulfillment after the rapture, when the Lord turns back his attention to Israel, as of yet still under the law, like the Samaritan woman was. So like the solstice sun, Jesus stood still amongst the Samaritans for a few days, drawing them unto himself before going down to Cana again where he had performed the first miracle of changing water into wine prior. So let us now consider the evidence that Jesus came looking for a bride in John chapter 4. In the New Testament, nowhere else do we read of the drawing of water from a well. So this is unique in John 4 and it is absolutely significant. In the Old Testament, there are only five examples and if we go by the law of first mention, we have a perfect match between the first records of the drawing of water in both testaments. In Genesis chapter 24, we witness Abraham's servant asking Rebekah for water when she was drawing water from a well, a type of the Holy Spirit visiting Rebekah. He was looking for a bride for his master's son Isaac. And similarly, in John chapter 4, we witness Jesus asking for water from the Samaritan woman when she was drawing water from the well again. In the Old Testament, Abraham's closest, sorry, eldest servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. He came looking for a bride for Jesus. In the New Testament, the bridegroom came looking for a bride himself. The second Old Testament example of drawing of water from a well is also revealing. In Ruth, we covered that before, chapter 2, verse 9, Boaz told Ruth to drink the water drawn from the well by his servants whenever she felt thirsty. Here, Boaz, the kinsman redeemer and bridegroom, offers water to Ruth, the Gentile bride, much like Jesus offers living water to the Samaritan woman. Jesus being our kinsman, redeemer, and bridegroom. Thus the drawing of water episodes where a potential bride and husband meet are very strong evidence that Jesus indeed comes looking for a bride in John chapter 4 as well, sealed by the law of first mention in both testaments. In like manner, the Lord will one day come down from heaven to complete his redemption of us, his purchased possession, his betrothed, who have had a similar encounter with him as did the Samaritan woman and the disciples afterward, and exchange their temporary and eternal living water grown in fellowship with him, have had an offer of exchange of meat of a predominant focus on earthly resources towards the heavenly sourcing and a submission to and thereby an entry into the relationship of the Lord Jesus with the Father himself, offering a deepening of their faith walk. And that aspect of the story to me was really uh, edifying and um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to share it with you as well. So I compared some data from the summer solstice with the narrative in John 4. I'm going to skip them for time reasons, but you can search them in the article. The sun, while continuing to traverse the ecliptic, is visibly standing still from our perspective at its peak position for three days. So in that respect, the solstice lasts longer than just one day. And it is on the top of the trajectory's arch, or the arch mountain of the sun's trajectory. And the narrative says about noon. So the noon description is reflective of the summer solstice. Much like Jesus sitting and resting at the Samaria mountaintop, the watch mountain, waiting for his sought-after moon bride, the Samaritan woman, to pass by and draw water, reflecting the annual ring of fire solar eclipse the next morning. At the moment they conjunct, from early morning till just after noontime, as described in the narrative as well, and a divine exchange between natural well water, the Old Testament law, 
and the supernatural living water, the New Testament spirit and truth, takes place. The annual ring of fire solar eclipse takes place at the celestial silver gate, the gate of man in Taurus, denoting the Lord Jesus coming down to both rescue those unaccountable and safe in him, those closely abiding in him, but to judge those who are wayward due to unbelief and disobedience while extending your mercy and grace he's going to come down in judgment as well so we see a double picture of the lord coming down to rescue and save in addition to judging those who deny or reject him after the solar eclipse we see once again the hidden moon progressing to vesta the wandering star crossing the threshold of the dwelling in the bride and bridegroom cluster and there are more interesting matches between John 4 and the rapture so the narrative structure reflects the timing as the story culminates between verses 20 to 26 when Jesus reveals himself to her as the Messiah syncing with this solstice week timing and the expected revelation of Jesus Christ to both new believers regarding his sin coming but also a deepening of the walk of his walk with the disciples of a closer drawing onto himself and um, there are much more parallels in the narrative and they are linked over here so Samaria is called a watch mountain and celestially the meeting takes place over there so we are called to watch and pray to be found worthy to escape all things and taken prior to the Lord's coming down in judgment and meeting him halfway of which the mountain is a picture as well. So the Hebrew word for almond, sheked, is also translated to watch. We may recall from reading the first article on this site how by seeing the almond branch, God assured Jeremiah he is watching over his word to bring it to pass, to perform it, no matter the passage of time. And in context of him speaking to Jeremiah about this, God had just given Israel a warning. I have this day set, over, set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Then, after Jeremiah sees the almond tree, God goes uh, God shows him a boiling pot over Jerusalem, which portends calamity. So the almond is both a sign of hope that God will eventually fulfill his wonderful promises to both the natural Israel and the spiritual Israel, us, but the context is more ominous. There is judgment involved as well. So later, God repeated the warning through Jeremiah. Behold, I will watch, or sheked, over them for evil and not for good. God's message to Israel was that sin has consequences and there will come a time of reckoning when there is no repentance, namely the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of Israel. We know that at the time of his coming in the rapture, he will come to both rescue and judge. He will watch over his word either for curse or for blessing. And we Recall how in the text Jesus refers to a time that people will no longer watch, uh, pray or worship in the temple or on the mountain, but only in spirit and truth. And that is not just by volition, but also by necessity. So there's another timing clue in the narrative with regard to summer wheat. Another wheat harvest time clue is given when Jesus says, Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look upon the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto a life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So this has to be speaking of the summer wheat harvest, which matures in four months after sowing, as we've shared earlier in the segment of the article about the summer wheat and Paul's travel log, confirming Pentecost is still open. The Pentecost fully come time frame will not um, end until July 19th. 
I'll continue about that in the next video. See you there.